Staircase Stories, narrated by Nathan and Nicholas Bowling. We live in the realm of reality, but truth is always elusive. It leads us deeper into the tunnels of evidence and beyond the reaches of fantasy. The only explanation will be found descending the staircase, coming down. Contents of this episode may not be suitable for all. Listener discretion is advised. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Staircase Stories. I'm your host, Nathan. I am your other host, Nicholas. And we are finally back with our third episode. It took us a little bit to get here, but we're finally here. And so let's just jump right into it. Our first story is The Ascent. Ever wonder what the extent of the human body could withstand? The lengths our bodies would go through just to keep us alive. Fly along with Ava as her body is pushed beyond its limits and more in the ascent. Hey, you ready for this? Jesse asked as he finalized his gear for the flight. Always, replied Ava. And ready she was. Ava had been a paraglider for the last 10 years. She never really felt comfortable on the ground. Flying was meditative to her. The isolation gave her time to reflect and think. She looked forward to doing just that today. Teams from different countries lined the hillside in pairs all practicing for the coming competition. Most had already launched, but a few, however, remained behind, still double checking equipment. Hey guys! shouted Luke, the team's manager, while looking at his barometer. What's up, Luke? Ava called over her shoulder. Thunderstorms rolling in. Think you guys may have missed your window to jump, he warned. Relax, Luke. We'll be fine, Jesse said with a smile, securing his goggles to his face. Ava began her run and glided effortlessly off the hill into the air as Jesse followed not far behind. Luke could be heard somewhere in the wind shouting, Stay safe! This was what they lived for, soaring through open skies, the cool breeze of wind dancing off their face. Nothing compared. They were soaring for half an hour over the mountain ridge line until they came upon the open savanna plains. In the distance, she could see hundreds of paragliders ahead, about five miles. In between them, storm clouds began rolling in faster than anyone anticipated. Hey, Ava! Her radio chimed in. Yeah, Jesse, she replied, grabbing her radio. The clouds are coming in pretty fast. Maybe Luke was right. Think we should descend? It's too dangerous to go under them. I think we can make it. I can see the other teams just ahead, she insisted. After a short pause, he finally responded. Okay, I'm with you, he assured her. Just then, a team member from another country sailed past Jesse and Ava. He too was in a race against the storm, risking the odds. As they watched him fly past, they could see the sky grow darker and darker. All three began feeling the rainfall begin abruptly. Two storm clouds of different sizes, from opposing directions, threatened to pin the foreign paraglider in the air. He weaved and dodged incoming balls of hail when suddenly he was struck by lightning. His glider whipped around, making his body look like a ragdoll, until the updrafts made him ascend rapidly into the darkness. Ava instantly knew she had made a grave mistake as the two storm clouds converged into one giant thundercloud. Attempting to fly over the storm, the wind began dragging their paragliders inward. Jesse instantly began pulling on one side of his chute, causing him to dangerously spiral downward, his GPS and compass beeping wildly, attempting to warn him of his increasing fall. His years of experience guided his arms instinctively. Hail began pelting Jesse as rain danced off his chute. There was no time to radio to Ava or Luke. Every bit of his strength was needed to bear against the raging wind. He knew if he panicked now, it would all be over. All he could do was hold his maneuver for as long as possible. Finally, he was below the upward drafts of the storm, freeing his arms from the aggressive clutches of the wind. As he continued his descent, he looked up and could see Ava also fighting the tumultuous downward spiral until he watched as what seemed like an invisible hand yanked her upwards into the storm cloud itself. He attempted several times to reach her via radio, but, of course, received nothing in return. In the distance below him, he could make out a small farm. He pulled on his chute and prepared for landing. Relief washed over Jesse as his foot touched the ground, but it wasn't over yet. Hail continued pouring down all around him as lightning streaked overhead. He unclipped his gear and ran for shelter in a nearby shed. Ava fought the upward drafts with all of her strength, but to no avail. She was ascending like a bullet. Her GPS tracked her upward movement at 60 feet a second. 
It was as though she was covering the length of a bowling alley in a second. The lift was so strong, she almost passed out from G-force. Lightning and hail moved in the air like sharks in the ocean, circling their prey. It was impossible for Ava to see. The storm clouds were pitch black, save for the occasional lightning illuminating the glistening hailfall. The wind whistled in her ears so loud she thought her eardrums were going to explode. The noise only broken by the much louder thunder that cracked the skies. Her paraglider sailed as though it had a mind of its own. Every movement was outside of her control. She attempted several times to regain command, but it was impossible. She reached for her radio as her body and glider shot in every direction. Luke! I'm in the storm! I can't see anything! She cried over the radio, although she knew no one could help her now. Her equipment struggled to give warning sounds as ice began to build on her clothes and skin. It felt as though she would freeze to death. Ava could only think of her parents. Please God, don't let me die this way. Don't let my parents see me if I do, she thought to herself. As she rocketed upward, she was catapulted above the eye of the storm. She caught another glimpse of her GPS warning of her altitude when everything went black. At this height, the oxygen was sucked from her lungs, leaving her body unconscious in her now steady glider. The winds were freezing, but calm. The temperature was 50 degrees below zero, causing her shoe, clothes, and body to totally freeze. Her body entered into a state of hibernation, like a bear in winter. Her heart rate slowed, allowing less oxygen needed for the brain to function. By all accounts, Ava should be dead. She hung suspended in the air like a hammock for almost an hour. The stark contrast of her new surroundings were unknown to her. Thousands of feet below, a great thunderstorm continued to rage on. As her body lay limp to one side, she drifted in large circles directly over the dark clouds beneath. The ice continued to build over her chute until it finally collapsed, sending her into a deadly freefall back into the raging storm. Ava? Ava, do you copy? No response. Images of the rival of Paraglider's sudden death replayed in Jesse's head over and over again. Pushing it from his mind, he radioed for Luke. Luke, it's Jesse, do you copy? Jesse? Thank God you're okay. Is Ava with you? No, it looks like she got pulled in. Send me your coordinates, I'll pick you up. When Luke arrived at the farm, Jesse ran out to his van, and the two began searching the skies for Ava. While they were driving along the backcountry roads, the radio suddenly chimed in. Ava's voice broke through the static. Ava! Luke replied over the radio, Ava, do you copy? No response. Jesse and Luke didn't say anything to each other. What was there to say? All they could do was pray for Ava's safe return. Ava was falling fast as her unconscious body dipped back into the deadly storm below. Her speed increased by gravity until her chute suddenly reopened, jarring Ava back to consciousness. Her eyes shot open as a beep repeated louder and louder, sharpening her awareness. Her equipment giving another attempt to alert her of impending danger. She moved without thinking, pulling down on one side of her chute and began to spiral downward once more. The wind caused every ounce of her strength to be used. She could feel herself slipping away again into the reaches of unconsciousness, but she refused to succumb. No. Stay awake, Ava, she told herself. Hang on. She could see the edge of the storm cloud now. She knew it wasn't over yet. Lightning and hail the size of oranges continued to spawn all around her. She could feel the frost around her face and hands begin to melt from the decrease in altitude. With limited mobility from her frozen state, she began weaving and dipping, finessing her way along. She felt another upward wind attempt to drag her back into the stratosphere. With one final downward pull, she finally freed herself from the invisible clutches of the storm's wind. Circling upon descent, she could see an open patch of farmland and made her way to the destination. Her hands and fingers could hardly move, black from frostbite, but she tried everything to perform a graceful landing as her feet touched down on green grass. She couldn't believe that she had made it back to Earth. Her body was freezing but her determination forced her to attempt to stand. She had underestimated how tired she was, couldn't move at all. All that, I'm gonna die here of hypothermia, she thought to herself. She suddenly remembered her radio and attempted to use it, her hands fumbling the device as she pressed the receiver to speak. However, nothing came out. Exhaustion snuffed out her words as she tried to talk. Tears began pouring from Ava as defeat set in. She laid there waiting to die, waiting for this nightmare to finally be over.
Ava's eyes shot open with new life breathing into her as she heard her cell phone ring. She had completely forgotten she had it. It took everything she had to reach for her phone in a pocket within her shirt. The screen flashed Jesse's name. Her heart filled with relief to see her teammate had made it out of the storm alive. Her finger clumsily slid across her phone, answering the caller. Ava? Ava, are you okay? Hello? Ava! Jesse screamed into his phone. Still unable to speak, she turned on her GPS, allowing her team to locate her. Ava laid in her shoe as she waited for it. Thank you, God, was all she could think repeatedly. Ava was rushed into the hospital shortly after their arrival to her location. Surprisingly, she had no injuries aside from a few bruising from the hail and minor frostbite. Her team gathered around her bedside as they showed her her GPS. Nobody could believe what they saw. What is it? Ava asked the team. Ava, you were up at 30,000 feet for an hour. It's like you were at the top of Mount Everest with no gear for an hour. The room grew silent as the reality of that fact set in. All right, well, that was Ascent. What do you think? Man, that was a really cool story. I really enjoyed listening to that one because there's so much action in it. And you feel like, you, you mean, not only can you see it, you know, see what they're seeing, but also it feels like you're watching like a TV show or a movie or something because all of the cliffhangers are all done in perfect positions to where it's like, what is going to happen next? All you have to do is wait a few seconds and then you'll find out. So I thought the timing and everything was perfect in that one and the action... Nice. The action was was really good. Awesome. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, let's move on to the next story. The next one we got is the urban legend of Oxygen Douglas. Let's get into it. Urban legends. Where do they come from? Who actually starts these crazy stories, and do you think they have any truth to them? Listen as a road trip begins the haunting tale of the urban legend of Oxygen Douglas. Dylan and his friends were finally going on the camping trip they had planned since the end of their senior year in school, hiking along the Appalachian Trail. They had been meaning to do this years ago, but of course, life happens. Dylan worked as a bank teller while Sam and Tim worked at their local bar. Dylan had opposite hours and they hardly ever saw each other anymore. It wasn't until Dylan quit his job and convinced his friends to keep their promise they made years ago that sparked new life into the trip. Sam and Tim cashed in their PTO and just like that, they were off. The drive to the trail was long, but the guys enjoyed each other's company. Empty roads that stretched for miles without seeing a hint of civilization was just what they were looking for. They were surrounded by tall trees and winding streams and rivers, as they discussed recent events in their lives, both good and bad. Sam and Tim told inside jokes regarding work at the bar, which made Dylan feel confused at times. They did their best to explain the jokes, but that only seemed to make them less funny. What do you think you'll do when you get back, Dee? Sam asked from the back seat. I'm not sure really, replied Dylan. Hey, I'm sure we can get you a job at the bar, Sam said quickly. Oh, for sure, man, Tim affirmed. Thanks, guys, but I was kind of thinking of going back to school, actually, Dylan said, looking to his passengers. Look out! shouted Sam from the road. Just then, their car struck something in the middle of the road. Dylan pulled hard on one side of the steering wheel, turning his knuckles white. They veered right off the road and slammed hard into a large tree, sending Sam flying into the front seat. Both Dylan and Tim's head jerked forward from whiplash but they were otherwise unharmed. Sam, however, hit his head hard. A deep gash caused blood to pour from his forehead. Sam, you okay? Dylan asked while looking in his rearview mirror, hoping to see what they had hit. <sighs> My head. Sam's voice trailed off. Dylan, he obviously has a concussion. We need to call an ambulance. Why weren't you wearing your seatbelt, man? Tim asked Sam harshly. Oh, what did we hit? Sam managed to say. I'm not sure. Tim, try to call an ambulance. I'm going to go see what it was, said Dylan, making his way out of the wrecked vehicle. As Dylan approached where he was sure the impact happened, he could see freshly caught fish scattered all over the road. 
Among the fish laid a broken fishing pole and net. He'd hoped it had been some sort of animal, but these supplies suggested something different. His heart dropped when he saw blood trailing off the pavement into the dense forest. Hello? Dylan called out into the thick brush. He looked, but made no movements forward. His gaze was startled by Tim walking up beside him. Dylan, I'm not getting service out here. Whoa, what's all this? Dylan? Tim asked, looking at the fish and blood on the road. I... I think I hit someone. A... a person, said Dylan flatly. Dude, don't say that, man, replied Tim. Probably a hiker, look. They just caught fish from that river. I'm gonna go try to find them, see if they're okay. Stay here with Sam, said Dylan, shock still in his voice as he ran into the thick forest. Dylan followed the blood trail into the woods until it came to a stop near a large tree. He looked up and all around the tree, but he didn't see anything. Dylan's mind went wild with the endless possibilities of what had happened. What did I hit? Dylan thought to himself. It was starting to get dark when Dylan made the difficult decision to leave the woods and head back to Sam and Tim. Sam really needed medical attention and unfortunately, they were in the worst possible scenario. A wrecked car, a friend with a head injury, and no phone signal. When Dylan got back, Tim rushed out of the car to see him. Dylan! Did you find anything? No, nothing. I don't know what we hit. How's Sam doing? Dylan asked. Sam's messed up, man. He really needs a doctor. His head looks horrible, replied Tim. Is he awake and talking? Yeah, he's awake, but he's puked about four times already. You really didn't see anything? Tim asked again. No, I didn't. Hmm, maybe it was an animal, said Tim. I thought that until I saw the fishing rod and fish. I don't know, maybe I hit their dog or something, said Dylan. Or maybe it was someone and they're making their way back to their camp for help. They must have planned to cook that fish somehow, said Tim. As Dylan and Tim were talking, Sam tried to get out of the car. He took a few steps then fell over unconscious. The two friends ran over and picked him up and put him back in the car. He wasn't doing good. His cut had made his forehead swell to the size of a grapefruit. Luckily, they had a first aid kit and was able to bandage the wound. They knew if they didn't act soon, something really bad could happen to Sam. The night seemed darker out here. Little light made its way through the tall trees looming overhead. The temperature dropped drastically in the night, making Sam feel even worse. Dylan kept thinking about what, or even, who he'd hit, how someone is out there right now in pain, or maybe even dead, and it was all his fault. That thought continued to haunt him. Tim suggested one of them started walking down the road to find help, but they quickly rejected the idea when they started to see light in the woods. Tim, look, is that a fire in the distance? Asked Dylan, looking over his steering wheel. Yeah, it looks like it. One of us should go check it out, see if they have some way of radioing for help said Tim. I'll go. I at least know where the trail starts from going in earlier, said Dylan making his way out of the car. Sam and Tim watched as Dylan made his way to the back of the car and into the trunk. He retrieved his pocket knife, opened it, and then closed it again. Just in case, said Dylan to Tim. Hurry back man, be careful, said Tim as he watched Dylan make his way back into the forest. The fire proved to be further than he'd originally thought. He considered several times to turn around, but ultimately chose to continue on. He hoped he could find someone that would be able to help them. It took him about 30 minutes to reach his destination as he emerged from a dark trail into a large clearing. The burn pit was steadily roasting as it cast light to the surrounding area. In the center of the clearing sat a cabin with a large porch where rocking chairs sat, swaying in the wind. A smaller shed sat just behind it, with oxygen tanks lining both sides. Hello? We need some help! yelled Dylan. Peter? Is that you? said a man making his way out of the cabin. No, my name's Dylan. We were in a car accident, my friend. He's, he's really hurt. I need to call for help, said Dylan back to the man, who was now standing on his front porch. Oh my gosh, please, come in, you can use our radio to call whoever you need, the man replied. Thank you so much, said Dylan, as he made his way inside. As he radioed the local ranger for help, the man offered Dylan some coffee, to which he politely declined. 
The rangers assured Dylan they would be on their way soon, although he wasn't looking forward to explaining the accident. I'm Douglas, by the way, the man said. I thought you were my brother Peter when you walked up. You guys were in an accident, you said. What happened? I think an animal jumped in front of the car. I'm not really sure. I lost control and slammed right into a tree, said Dylan. Well, I guess it's a good thing we stay stationed up here with supplies for hikers just like yourself, said Douglas. Yeah, I saw the oxygen tanks. I wasn't really sure what to think, said Dylan, pointing over his shoulder. You wouldn't believe the number of asthmatic hikers, most of which often forget their inhaler. We learned a long time ago to keep oxygen tanks and IV drips at the ready, just in case. Oh, are you guys doctors? We're. We're retired military. After his wife passed, we decided to move out here. Now we just live off the land, aside from the occasional trips into town. Most hikers know this spot well. We help whenever we can. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, speaking of, I don't know where Peter is. He went fishing earlier, and I haven't seen him all day, said Douglas as he looked out the window. Dylan's heart instantly sank as he began to realize just whom he had hit. He didn't know what to do or say. He decided it best for him to get back to his friends. He would tell the rangers everything once they showed up. But just then, a blood-curdling yell could be heard on the front porch. Douglas! Douglas! Douglas, help me! Douglas's eyes flashed wide in horror as he recognized Peter's voice. Peter! shouted Douglas as he opened the door to find his brother, blood coming from his mouth. Dylan was frozen in shock, his legs anchored to the floorboards beneath. Douglas held his dying brother in his arms. Peter had done his best to stop his external bleeding from his wounds. However, there was nothing he could do about the internal bleeding. He tried hard to get to the only one who could help him out here, his brother. But nothing could be done. Dylan and Douglas watched as Peter died on the front porch. After a few moments, Douglas broke the silence. An animal? You said you hit an animal? Douglas looked at Dylan, a look only found in the eyes of a man seeking revenge. Dylan reached for his pocket knife as Douglas quickly attacked. So, where's your friend? The ranger asked him. I told you, man, he's the one who called you guys. He went into the forest. Maybe he's still wherever he called you from. I, I don't know. Tim pointed somewhere in the woods. Well, unfortunately, I don't know where he radioed us from, said the ranger. He went in that direction. Can you please, please come back and look for him? Tim pleaded with the ranger. <sighs> okay, yeah. After this one gets some medical attention, I'll drive you back out here. The ranger pointed at Sam as the paramedics finally arrived. Over the next couple of days, Dylan's disappearance seemed like a nightmare. Rangers searched through the surrounding woods of the accident, and they managed to find the lone cabin. It was a popular location amongst hikers, so they figured that's more than likely where Dylan went. But the cabin owner, Douglas, claimed to have never met or seen anyone by the name Dylan. Although authorities had their suspicions of Douglas, no one was ever charged for his disappearance. No body, no crime. Sam and Tim went back to the forest several times that year to look for any clues regarding Dylan's whereabouts, but nothing ever came of it. To this day, they hike every year in hopes one day they'll find an answer. Deep within the Appalachian Trail, a man walked out of his small cabin and sat in the middle of a clearing surrounded by woods. In total seclusion, he breathed in the morning air and walked to his meager shed just behind his home. Making his way to the kitchenette, he began prepping his coffee. He striked a match to light the eye of his stove and placed a pot of water on top. Grinding the coffee beans to an even grit, he poured them into the filter. As the water calmly began to boil, he walked to the outside of the shed. On one side, several oxygen tanks lined the outer wall. One, in particular, had tubes that ran right into the ground. He checked the level of the tank and replaced it with a fresh one. Above the tank hung an IV drip, with tubes of fluid also running into the ground. He checked the levels of the fluids and replaced it as well. He made his way back inside to finish making his coffee. 
He grabbed the now boiling water and poured it through the filter as he filled his favorite mug. Leaving through the back door, he decided to sit in a rocking chair on the porch. He sipped his freshly brewed coffee and watched the sunrise as he enjoyed the sounds of the muffled scream of agony from Dylan buried just beneath his feet. All right, that was the urban legend of Oxygen Douglas. What'd you think of this one? Man, yeah, this one, every time we do these episodes, man, I always say, now this is my favorite one now. And this is one of those times because this is now my favorite story because it's so scary. It's so horrifying, but it's so possible. Like, you know, that sort of stuff happens all the time, you know, accidents and manslaughter. And in this, right. this case, they were out in a secluded area, you know, and everyone's a, a small town, you know, everyone's tight. You know, especially like that was his brother. It's, oh man, just, it's totally possible. Um, and it's just, it's, it's terrifying. It's a really good story. That's my, my new favorite. That's your new favorite? Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, it's always interesting to think of, uh, how did urban legends get started in the first place? You know, like, yeah. where did they even come from? So, right. So this was kind of a, a cool one. Awesome. All right. Well, that moves us right along to our final story. And that is the smoking gun. Let's do it. Blessings and curses date back beyond the first century. Blessings can be curses, and curses, in time, can be blessings. Find out the truth behind an old war tale in The Smoking Gun. My grandfather was a decorated World War II veteran. He would always tell me his famous stories of how he and his platoon fearlessly entered into enemy territories and had countless victories, highlighting all of the great deeds he and his men accomplished for our country. He would go through the details and would make adjustments to his story so I could listen. Gory details. The kind children shouldn't hear. It wasn't until after he died that my dad would reveal to me all of those removed facts. One in particular always stood out to me. You see, my grandfather had a prized possession. A pistol an M1911. When he died, he passed it down to my dad. But this gun was unlike any other gun, he would tell me. Sure, it looked the same as others in appearance, nothing about it seemed special. But this gun could shoot only one thing. Nazis. The story goes like this. Blessed by a Jewish rabbi on an American military base, the gun was presented to my grandfather's commanding officer. This CO led multiple campaigns against the Nazi-occupied France with my grandfather being a part of his company. On one particular occasion, a group of Nazi soldiers ambushed my grandfather and his team on a back road somewhere deep in a foreign farmland that cut right through a large forest. The American soldiers were traveling towards a known hostile area with orders to put down anyone wearing the swastika. The men were almost in a meditative state, preparing for the coming events, when suddenly bullets flew in the air. As the American men scrambled to make sense of the attack, the Germans rushed out of the dense forest. My grandfather watched as his brothers in arms fell one by one all around him. Only a few were quick enough to find cover. His CO was struck right in the throat by a well-aimed shot, but he didn't die instantly. My grandfather saw this and ran straight for him, dragging him behind cover. CO couldn't even speak, blood was gushing from his wound, but he managed to put the pistol in my grandfather's hands. Without wasting a minute, my grandfather stood and began firing in the enemy's direction. Bang! One would fall. Bang! Another one. Then another. And another. And another. Bang! 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 It was as though he couldn't miss. Five men down, he counted, as he knelt and took cover again. Bullets suddenly rained down on my grandfather as one of the German soldiers brought an automated weapon. He stayed ducked down, hoping the bullets wouldn't penetrate his cover. When the round was exhausted, my grandfather shot his arm up and randomly fired in the direction of the gunfire. When no bullets fired back, he stood once more. Looking around for more enemies, he could see that he had shot the Nazi right between the eyes. His men and the men of the German lay scattered everywhere. He would describe it as a literal bloodbath. His adrenaline was still kicking when he felt someone grab his shoulder from behind. Spinning, he fired his weapon. But instead of the familiar bang, 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 he could only hear click, click, click. To his surprise, it was one of his men. Don't shoot, don't shoot, it's me, shouted his fellow soldier. My grandfather thanked God that his gun had jammed when it did, and the two men began gathering their dead. 
As the other soldier radioed back to base, my grandfather inspected his CO's weapon. You know, to unjam it. Only, it wasn't jammed. There were still two bullets left, one being in the chamber. He attempted several times to fire the weapon, but nothing happened. It continued acting as though it were jammed. He suddenly remembered the rabbi's blessing, and made his way back to one of the enemy's body. He aimed the gun at the lifeless corpse and pulled the trigger. Bang, bang! The recoil surprised him. He expected the gun not to fire. The only conclusion my grandfather ever came to was that this gun really was blessed. It really only could shoot a Nazi. That weapon was passed down to me. It's an antique, but still looks brand new. My grandfather and my dad always made sure to keep it clean and in perfect condition, so that when they would tell the tale of the Nazi shooting gun, if anyone ever challenged them, they could pull it out and have the skeptic examine it. How it should fire. It should work. But it doesn't. It now sits above my fireplace, always loaded just in case I ever tell the story just as I'm doing to you right now. It's not there for any kind of real use, just looks cool. I actually don't even own a functioning gun, which was why I was so surprised that after all of these years, it finally went off. One night recently, I had just gotten out of the shower. I was brushing my teeth when I heard something in the living room. I live alone and I don't have pets, so it could have been anything. So I set the toothbrush down and listened closely for anything out of the ordinary. There was definitely someone in my house. I could hear them opening and closing drawers. My suspicion turned true when I heard an unfamiliar voice say something to another intruder in my house. Panic set in as I locked the door and dialed 911. The operator instructed me to wait in the bathroom and to be as quiet as I could, although I'm sure they had to have heard the shower. I remember thinking, I can't believe I'm a victim of a home robbery. My thoughts fell silent as someone on the other side of the bathroom door began turning the knob. Hey, we have guns. Come out here. We won't hurt you. A man spoke through the door. I refused to speak. The man started banging on the door as terror filled my every thought. I kept thinking, when are the police going to show up? It felt like an eternity waiting. I didn't know why the men weren't using the guns they said they had. They should have been able to blast their way in, but they just kept banging on the door. I finally heard the words I was waiting for. Freeze, police! I heard an officer yell. I dove in my tub as I heard the guns going off. After a few minutes, police began knocking at the bathroom door. I unlocked the handle and to my horror, two teenage boys from the neighborhood lay dead in my living room. The window facing my neighbor's window had been shot at. In one of the boys' hands, I could see my grandfather's pistol. Smoke was still exiting the barrel from its recent discharge. The burglars found my gun, tried to use it on me, and then opened fire at the police, but missed wildly. They only managed to fire one bullet. I was surprised it fired at all. As the police were investigating my home regarding the break-in, they noticed the bullet that exited my gun and shot through my window also shot through my neighbor's window. When the police went next door, nobody answered. They left a note for them to call the police when they returned. I told them that my neighbor's vehicle is home and he's disabled, he rarely leaves. Seeing my concern for my neighbor, they decided to do a welfare check just to make sure. What they found still shocks me to this day. My neighbor was struck and killed by that rogue bullet from my gun. They also found Nazi memorabilia and a large print copy of Mein Kampf in one of his bedrooms. You see, my neighbor was a disabled German World War II veteran. He was also a Nazi. All right, so that was the smoking gun. What'd you think of that about that one? You think it's possible? <laughs> oh, uh, I, I offhand, I would say coincidence. I would say I no. Know. I don't think it's possible. Now that may be it too—a coincidence, just a, a weird coincidence because it got jammed up, you know, and then unjammed. I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's possible, but we're getting to that in just a second here. Final thoughts on on uh, smoking gun. Uh, smoking gun, a really entertaining story, but not true. Not true? Yeah. All right. What about the urban legend of Oxygen Douglas? Oh, see, that one is tough. Uh, that was, obviously, like I said, my new favorite. Oh, man, that's hard. Um, I'm going to say that is, that is true. That's a true one. 
All right, so that obviously rules out uh, the ascent. Then, uh, what was your final thoughts on the ascent? The, what, what ruled that one? I really like that one too. That one's really good. You know, like the cliffhangers and stuff. Perfect for the podcast platform. Uh, very well written on that. Good job on that, bro. The thing that gave it away is I don't know. I just don't think it's possible for somebody to be up there for that long without like you know breathing equipment and all that. That's just my take. I know nothing about skydiving or any of that hang gliding. That's just me. But I'm gonna say that one was fake. All right, so you, so the conclusion is the urban legend of Oxygen Douglas. That's your final guess? Yes, that's my final guess. That is true. Tell me it's true. All right. <laughs> the answer is it's not true. Oh. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, so let's change things up a little bit. Let's give you another guess. Okay, all right. Yeah, that works. That's cool. Okay, so since that one is not true, um, I am going to say the uh, ascent is uh true all right you got it that's right the ascent is the true story as crazy <laughs> oh as it God. sounds it is the true story so uh one thing i do want to wow. mention with um the urban legend of oxygen douglas is this was um kind of half written by Cade shepherd the one that was on the last episode he had uh kind of had a little bit of an inspiration and i um kind of realized it kind of had it come to a you know, a full story, uh, but definitely want to give him some credit for that. So, yeah, shout out uh, to Cade. Good job. Yeah, shout out to Cade. Good job, Cade. So, yeah, so the ascent. Well, let's uh, get into it and see what was real and, and what wasn't. All right, so usually I would break down the story and kind of give you another retelling of the story. This story in particular, I pretty much told you exactly what happened. So pretty much I changed uh, a few names and other than that, that's about it. So what I thought I would do this time is kind of give you um, from the paraglider's perspective and give you a few quotes from her and let her kind of tell you what she was experiencing during during that flight. So her name is Eva Wisnierska and she is a German paraglider that survived lightning, pounding hail, and minus 40 degree temperatures and oxygen deprivation after a storm system sucked her into an altitude higher than Mount Everest. Her, her survival is actually the, uh, the same chances of winning the lotto 10 times in a row that's how rare her survival actually was so wow yeah um the only reason why she survived was because she blacked out that that was the only thing uh that actually saved wow her life. so we have a few quotes here from her um and let's just kind of hear it from her perspective um she's speaking in a little bit of broken english so i'll try to um, mend those sentences as I go. So, quote, It was because that I got unconscious that my heart slowed down all the functions and that saved my life, end quote. The paraglider who was next to her that was flying from the um, her opposing team uh, that got struck by lightning, this is really strange. I found many conflicting um, results on how he actually died. The first result I was finding was that he was struck by lightning, the way the story goes. Um, but some other uh, outlets are suggesting that he died from suffocation or that he froze to death uh, from being sucked into that storm. But his name was Zong Pin, and he was a Chinese paraglider who was only 42 years old. So he basically had the same exact experience as Ava, only he didn't make it out. Um, he didn't make it out alive. Wow. So, um, yeah, so uh, Ava's top speed of ascent was clocked at 20 meters per second, uh, which is about um, 60 yeah. feet a wow. second. And then her descent was 33 meters per second, which would be about 90 feet uh, per second. So just like we said in the story, that's roughly the length of a bowling alley. So imagine running down the bowling alley within a second. Like that fast is how how fast she was shooting uh, upwards. So extremely, uh, extremely violent wow. uh, storm system that she That's was insane. In. She says, "quote You can't imagine the power. You feel like nothing, like a leaf from a tree going up." End quote. Then she continues on. "quote I was shaking all the time. The last thing I remember, it was dark. I could hear lightning all around me. I knew I was in the middle of the thunderstorm, and I couldn't do anything." End quote. 
she continues on here, um, quote, From the theory, I knew the chances of surviving are almost zero. I knew I can only have luck. I can't do anything. And I got it. End quote. So Ava had been training for the uh, upcoming paragliding world championship. Uh, that's why she was actually out there on the field and, and they were practicing. They knew that a storm was coming, uh, but they didn't. They, they couldn't account for the other storm that was coming from the opposite ends. And when those two storms uh, met each other, they actually created like a super storm essentially. So she says, quote, I wanted to fly around the clouds, but I got sucked 20 meters per second up into it, and I started to spiral, end quote. She goes on to say, quote, after 40 minutes or an hour, I woke up, and I was at 6,900 meters. I was still flying, but I realized I didn't have the brakes in my hand. So 6,900 meters is about 22,000 feet. So our airplanes fly at around 30,000 feet. So when she was descending and she woke up, she was actually about 8,000 feet lower than she had been previously while she was unconscious up there. They do talk about the doctors saying that her body actually went into a hibernetic state, uh, similar to like a bear. And it's, it's kind of odd, like, like humans don't really do that. You know, she, she is the only human to go up that high and survive without any gear. You know, we hear about people climbing Mount Everest all the time uh, with gear, with climbing equipment, and not even being able to make it. So uh, the fact that her body did this is, is pretty incredible. She goes on to say, uh, quote, I saw my hands and the gloves were frozen and I didn't have the brakes, and the glider was still flying on its own. I was thinking I can't do anything, so I can only wait and hope that the clouds would bring me out somewhere. I couldn't even imagine that. You're just hoping that that the storm just releases you. You know, there's really no reason to think it will, uh, but you know, just just hope, I guess. She goes on. Yeah, to, just like I would, I would freak out. Like, man, I'm gonna be stuck here forever. Right? Yeah. Like, is this ever gonna come to an end? Am I just gonna keep going with this storm? Yeah, exactly. Or, or am I gonna pass out again? Is what I would be thinking. You know, I, maybe I got lucky the first time. Not, you know, maybe not again. Yeah. She says, "Quote." And then I woke up and was thinking, was I maybe unconscious for a minute? I don't know how long I was unconscious for, but we actually know based on her um, GPS of how high she was up, she was up there for over an hour with no oxygen, just, just up crap. there, just dangling up there above the storm. If she was conscious, she would actually have a very peaceful uh, moment up there, I'm sure it's probably very quiet and peaceful. And uh, below would be a raging storm, just just yeah. you know thousands <laughs> of feet just underneath. You know that's all. Okay, so the doctors say, quote, she was covered in ice. She suffered from severe frostbite. The temperature at that altitude was about minus 50 degrees, and it's higher than Mount Everest. End quote. They say that her injuries were severe, but just basically um, bruises. Uh, they go on to say, quote, she's got bruises all over her body from the hailstones and she's recovering from frostbite to her extremities. She's got bandages all over her head because her ears nearly got froze off. Wow. Yeah, it goes on to say she just remembers going up, lightning all around in the cloud, and she doesn't remember anything until coming down again. Those, uh, those hail, by the way, were the sizes of apples or oranges, and in some Dang. cases they were... Uh, like watermelon size. Whoa! Yeah, and she's just dodging them up there, not on purpose. I mean, the the you know the paragliders taking her left and right. So she was treated in a hospital. She was discharged the same day. She goes back to the field the same day and picks up her equipment that she left there. I mean, just <laughs> just absolutely incredible. Um, Savage. The, uh, her teammate that she was with that made it to the ground safely, if it wasn't for his, his dedication to keep searching for her and the other teammate uh, that was driving the van around, if it wasn't for them, you know, she probably would have died of hypothermia when she landed. So, um, you know, those guys, Absolutely. They, they really, um, you know, didn't give up on her. So, so that's pretty incredible. So all in all, that's the story of the ascent, and that's the story of Ava Wisnerska. And she was 35 at the time. Um, 
so this is a, uh, this is uh, something I actually saw on uh, Mr. Ballin. Uh, shorts that he has on YouTube. Uh, this particular article was by the Sydney Morning Herald and it's written by Linton Besser, Jano Gibson, and David Braithwaite. If you guys wanted to look into that any further. Yeah, so that's, that's the incredible story of Ava. I mean, just, just a wild, wild experience. And one of the quotes that I didn't get to mention here that she actually says in the story is that um, she felt like she was in the, in, in the middle of an ocean with sharks swimming around her, only they weren't oh, sharks, wow. it was lightning <laughs> and hail. So that's uh, that yeah, is... really intense imagery when you start thinking wow. about it along those lines. That concludes our episode three. Finally made it here. It's a big accomplishment for us at Staircase Stories to get to episode Absolutely. three. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Super awesome. Yeah. Plenty more to come. Stay tuned. Subscribe. However you're listening on Spotify, iHeartRadio, all that. Click the follow button. Like it if you can. Subscribe. Share it. Get this stuff out there because we are back and we're doing a lot more episodes of the horror cast coming soon. That's right. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Peace. Later. Have an idea for a true or false story? We want to hear it. Send it to staircasestories1 at gmail.com for a chance for it to be used in an episode.